if I'd have known that half of the industry was going to be here, I would have taken the gig. Um, just gone back from uh, Qatar, so uh, uh, I'm just still trying to get used to the temperatures in the room. Um, okay, I'm going to tell you a little about Evolve Growing Solutions. We are an organisation that is trying to find ways of taking great ideas and actually making them viable, really viable, as in you can actually use them viable. Um, the, uh, the basis of our approach and all of my work to date, I'm a forever PhD at the School of the Built Environment, Designing Sustainable Greenhouse Structures and Growing Systems, and basically rigging the hell out of all the propositions that we come across. But our base point is to go one step backwards from where an awful lot of research that is done with plants and uh, techniques to look at how natural systems operate. So we very much take plant and say, what does it do in nature? Because it's had a few million years longer to optimize what it does than we have. So my team here, I'm going to flash through this because my most important client is the person presenting next and this is going to be a very clear lecture not to overrun. The most important person to you guys on there, no doubt some of you recognise, is Steve Clarkson, uh, the ex-chairman of the Cucumber Growers Association. Uh, he is now the grower for Sahara Forest Project Direct, but he's also a director on our board and we work very closely together and have done for a number of years. Uh, okay, this is where it started. I'm known as Professor Bubbles by the real engineers at the university uh, who have lots of very interesting pictures pinned on their walls. Uh, we started with having double layer structures that use liquid foam as a way of insulating and creating cloud cover. The reason for that is plants have adapted to make use of the light that falls beneath clouds. Um, bubbles are the greatest and simplest way of replicating that. You're able to put the insulation in and take it out very rapidly, particularly for shading. Uh, the key factor for this is when you have places like Al Maria, we've done a lot of work with the Bank of Kahama uh, on research over there, you kill your light in the middle, uh, sorry, in the morning and the afternoon by trying to protect the plants from the middle of the day. It's like wearing a pair of sunglasses in your house. So we started with, let's have a building envelope that you can put in shading and take it away at the boundary layer, not inside the building, not once it's gone inside and we're trying to deal with all the heat depths. Okay, we had some involvement with the uh, Madrid Solar Decathlon here. The point I'm going to raise to you is this material here is a type of ETFE, which we'll get onto. This is an IR barrier film. It's like a permanent type of sunglasses. There's only 25 meters of this ever made, which they very kindly sponsored to me to put on the project. And uh, it was very useful. We are the project deliverers for the growing systems and the greenhouse aspects of the Sahara Forest Project, which is, uh, 46 degrees out there right now. Um, so imagine how much fun that is. We're working very closely with Max Fordham's, who are a major part of the team of Sahara Forest Project, to take really revolutionary ways of looking at everything. They've just taken things like Munters packs, who told you can't put salt water through it. They've said, what? And they've modelled it and looked at it, and it works perfectly well. Uh, there's even systems in this that uh, Bill will no doubt get onto, which use bitterns that actually close the greenhouse, use the Munters pads internally, to reduce the uh, moisture levels and the um, uh, relative humidity inside the building using the pads. We are the best because we work the best, we don't think we're the best, but what we, are, what we try and do is we don't try and know everything, we just get the very best people out there to work with. And because of what we're trying to do, we've got uh, VDH that they tell their kids uh, when they put them to bed that we're trying to work on things to change the world. So we kind of get people to do more than it's normal, which uh, Graham from uh, CFW is here and probably throw things at me for saying that, but uh, that's what we do. Okay, we work on three technologies. As far as we're concerned, there are big problems. We don't deal with water at this time, but we deal with three problems. One is the glazing materials we use for greenhouses. The second is the type of lighting that goes into that. And the third is, and much most important, but will only be a short part of this presentation, which is biochar. Uh, this is creating charcoal out of the, the materials in the world. We create 30 gigatons of CO2 on the planet. Uh, the biosphere trades between 500 and 600 gigatons, but it is recycled all the time. You track that as charcoal, you use the planet to take the CO2 out of the atmosphere. James Lovelock classes it as the only solution to climate change. Okay, ETFE. No doubt everyone in this room has heard something about ETFE. We work directly with the Sahai Glass, we're actually retained by them to uh, take uh, technologies and the ways that they're working on and rigor them to see whether they'll work. 
It's not based on oil, it's based on a, a mineral called fluorite, and it's an extremely stable polymer. Uh, there are projects out there that people have no doubt heard of. The Eden Project is uh, the first use of ETFE really in any sort of growing environment uh, in, in the UK. Uh, we're very lucky as part of exploration, which is part of the Sahara Forest Project, to be working closely with Michael Paul and who designed the Eden Project, and be able to have conversations with other people that think biomimicry is the way forwards. Uh, the water cube here was made using the ETFE that we used. It's actually three times thicker, simply to hold the colour blue. And uh, Eric went through a, uh, a process for PR to try and get a contract with the Chinese government of trying to ensure the building for 500 years, because as far as they're concerned, this material cannot grow. So what are the properties? You have an extremely stable polymer. Um, what is its lifespan? We don't know. There is thousands of greenhouses, thousands of hectares of greenhouses in Japan some of which are 30 years old, and I've been standing inside of them. You cannot take that material and know there's anything changed with it. There's a higher light transmission than any other material. One of the crucial factors is when you look at light transmission and the data, with respect to the scientists in the room, half of our work is deconstructing how the data was arrived at. So light transmission is always perpendicular to the surface. So you don't mention the fact that ETFE has a 5% reflective index, but glass has 19. Okay, it has extremely high tensile properties. There are examples of it on the table outside. This stuff is more like paper. Okay, it's very hard to put attention into it in the normal processes. So we're looking at other ways of doing it. But it means that you could potentially use the material as the tensile property of the building, reducing the amount of infrastructure you need. Um, okay, it's ideal for multi-layer greenhouses. Um, Glass houses are based on gas being free, or well, cheap enough that you don't have to worry about it. That's not going to happen in the future. Now, in architecture, ETFE is well known for, I've seen figures from 35 to 75% uh, less expensive to put into buildings compared to glass. Uh, surely, modular, long buildings with a single glazing material, there should be ways of finding ways of doing it that don't cost. Uh, as much as everyone thinks. Everyone will know a little bit about ETFE. The first thing they always ask is, how much does it cost? It's three times the price of glass. Oh, you can't use it. Okay. It's the cost of the building. It's very simple, it's a very simple concept. How much does the building cost? And how much does that building return to you over the 15 years of the mortgage in glass houses that is applied to that building? We look at energy savings because we can build out of two, three, four layers of to. The light quality we'll get onto, um, but uh, light, no doubt there's going to be a lot of questions and things going on later about light, um, but uh, the light transmission through ETFE includes the UV spectrum. This enables you to have higher, higher yields, I didn't put it on there, higher quality yields, higher bricks levels in your tomatoes, brighter coloured flowers, uh, more compact plants for shrubbery type plants, and you get to market earlier. So the point for us, we, we are about sustainability, but we are not about a hippified version, sorry, of sustainability. We're about, it's got to make financial sense in the marketplace today before anything else. Otherwise, nobody will use it. So, you got a building, okay? Well, I'm afraid to say, well, we'll get on to the light transmission. You can see it's all above 90%, but the most important thing here is this UV. Okay. The, uh, one thing that glass really doesn't do much with. There is 3,000 hectares of ETFE in Japan. There's 2,000 hectares of South Korea. And in the EU, well, it's only just starting because the glass industry is dominated by the Dutch who are very firm believers in glass. Uh, I'm not gonna say anything else other than what the customer says, because they're the only ones that really matter to me. Uh, prevents the abnormally elongated seedlings that result from insufficient light and from unbalanced light spectrum. Uh, the key thing is, little things, but to the industry guys in this room, this is what kind of stuff that matters. They stand up to the automated planting in the field. It makes a difference between whether a system works at all or not. And uh, that means that in their market, they have a more stable supply capacity, as well as lowering their operating costs because of energy. We are very, very lucky to have tied ourselves up with a company called Holstock. Lots of people have done films, lots of people have worked around films, lots of people have printed films and done this with this film and that and that. ETFE has a whole set of other properties that other people in the industry of films, including the Japanese, and this is the fourth largest corporation in the world, sorry, Japan, and the biggest glass producer in the world, have never looked at the heat shrink capacity of these polymers. Holscott has done nothing other than look at the 
thermal forming properties of this material. One of the ways they use it is in uh, these lights here. These are the lights that uh, you'll put in food production facilities. If they break, as you can see, all the glass is retained. They just hit five million, I believe, and uh, are cranking up quite severely from there. They do a lot of work with the aerospace industry. They can turn this stuff into <coughs> any shape or form, pretty much, you can imagine. And not only the market leaders in it, they're pretty much the only people who know how to do it. They even built the fuel cells for the space station. Okay. I went to them with an idea, having known the properties of heat shoot with ETFE, and said we could create glazing panels for this. This is not marketed directly for Glasshouse so much as the architectural applications, um, but it still has a very good place for small scale uh, ETFE structures that can be put up very easily. We take the film, we process it, we secondarily process it to a wider size, we put it inside of uh, the metal panel, as you've seen outside, and then you heat shrink it on, and that heat shrink has an incredible tensile property that we're testing right now. Uh, in fact, we have uh, a guy here, Ash, um, that we just used um, materials technology, which is one of the people that we use to bring up everything that we do. They, they are accredited laboratories and the heat shrink capacity of this is very high. This potentially means instead of all these air inflated pillows that you get in architecture, you could just have them heat pre-stressed uh, pre to put straight in. And you can't put them in fast enough. Uh, a 80 foot long greenhouse has just been erected and literally they couldn't unpack the panels fast enough to put them in. Uh, you talk about panels that would normally take in glass six people to lift and the uh, lovely lady here who uh, is uh, one of the directors of Hall Scott was there unpacking them and chucking them to the people and actually throwing them because they don't weigh anything. It means that you can have very simple design systems and pretty much make the panels as you wish. Crucially, you can redesign the back of a lorry and produce some two spec on site. This is a structure that was built to just test the idea. Um, and to the greenhouse guys in the room, yes, the profiles are very big. Uh, that is not because it requires it to be very big. That's just simply we had some left over from another project. Uh, okay. So our challenge with ETFV is to reduce the cost of the constructing the building envelope itself and this is all about developing rapid installation techniques. We're working with SARPA, uh, the aluminium profile company, to develop processes where you have this material coming straight off the roll with a wheel and a ridge and a wheel in the gutter, straight off, straight into the building, even upside down and put the bottom layer on. Um, to demonstrate clearly the impact on the yields, because nobody's really done that data, it's just everybody knows it. Um, we have an 800 square meter double layer ETFE greenhouse in Cambridge with uh, Steve Clark and those operations down there. And uh, the yields that we got from this, we took baby cucumbers from the glass that they struggled to grow to any decent level. The ones in the UTFE, same, <coughs> same variety, uh, got coined effing triffids because they grew so fast you had to double the amount of um, staff in there to maintain the crop. It also produced per square meter from one season, so you have three seasons of cucumbers, one season, more value per square meter than in that company's entire 120 million pound growing operation. 35 years. Okay, the next subject, and I'm having to flash through this because otherwise I'll get told off. Um, sulfur plasma lighting. I know there's an awful lot going on about lighting, about LED lighting, etc. I had my guys here to answer questions, um, so please don't flow, flow too many of me about this. Uh, the key thing is this is a sulfur plasma bulb, it is a little sun. Uh, it's used extensively now, um, in, uh, particularly with uh, Sava using them in 40 meter long light pipes because it produces continuous full spectrum light. Okay, not one light system that we have produces continuous full spectrum light. We have evolved and plants have evolved to take advantage of the light that falls from the sky, either under cloud cover or direct. It is an artificial sun. There's an A-class bulb which is used for research and is now a specified bulb for photovoltaic testing in laboratories. This has 3% of all the frequencies of the sun, 3% uh, across its band. Uh, another light version, which is the one that was being demonstrated here, uh, is, is using purely sulfur. It's all down to the chemicals you put inside the bulb. Uh, and that is producing it without the UV and very little of the infrared. So you can see here, 50% less UV and infrared creates a full and continuous spectrum. And one bulb can light up 20 meters, it's actually 40 meters, but you can call it uh, can be combined with traditional sunlight um, uh, light pipes. As far as we're concerned, if we were looking at a, uh, refitting a building from the standard building stock for a vertical farm, the first thing we want to do is drill a load of holes in it. 
get the light from outside into the building. The problem is, if the light you're going to do, you'll simply have downstairs toilets or whatever here because the light varies. If you integrate a sulfur plasma pile into the same light uh, pipe system and just vary it, you will be able to maintain natural sunlight through the day, through the night. Um, okay, 20,000, oh, sorry, flashing through here, 20,000 hour uh, light efficiency with the bulbs, it's actually much more. So this is the spectrum of the light uh, compared to sunlight with the triple A's. This is it with, uh, sorry for the blur images, with uh, purely sulfur. Uh, so as you can see here, it is a continuous spectrum of light, okay? I work with that, very good growers. <laughs> that wasn't supposed to happen, was it? <coughs> Anybody coming to the rescue? <laughs> <laughs> As far as everything that we've looked at, it's, it, there is so much research into LEDs, into light spectrum, the effect of the, the morphology of plants, etc., etc. And we've seen so many different results that it's kind of easy to get lost in it. Um, as far as we're concerned, our baseline is that plants have had millions of years to adapt to the light that's outside. We can change our eyes somewhat by you know, moving our eyes about to adapt to the lights that we have here. Plants are hardwired. light to something reduced. How can, it's, it's <coughs> what is usable light that is, as far as we're concerned, with a very simple reading that we matter to us. Sulfur plasma, the visible or the past spectrum, is we're looking at 73% efficiency compared down to the HPS air cooled at 38. The lamp itself, efficiency over time, we're going up to 20,000 hours here, all other bulbs degrade. <coughs> I'm sure everyone in the industry knows that. As far as the actual lifespan of the bulbs, the sulfur plasma is just extending beyond 20,000 hours. When it comes to greenhouses, it matters how many times you have to go and change the bulbs. Um, now, the reason why this curve is, is as it is is because it's slightly more expensive to put these bulbs in and the light pipes, etc. so we set that at a bit of a higher rate. But because of the fact, the only reason it has a bit of a curve instead of a trait line is because you will at one point have to change uh, one of the components inside the power supply. These lights, by the way, were developed by NASA in the 1990s for the Mars project and they are very, very good as far as they're concerned. The only problem is they could never get the power supply to work. Well, our guys very kindly fixed their bulb and sent it back to them three weeks ago. And they're very grateful. Okay, we're just gonna flash through these. These were taken at an interval of between three and four days. These, unfortunately, I didn't put the slide up, but these are compared to basically all the Sonic, Sonic T bulbs, all the, all the standard bulbs are out there. The only ones weren't LEDs because Philips refused to allow us to do the test with LEDs. Okay, this is three day intervals. I showed this to Steve Clarkson and he simply didn't believe it. This was done at Bargainen, and of, uh, research that's done on uh, growing here is done between Bargainen and TNO, which I'm sure everyone in the industry knows is uh, very reputable research stations on practical growing. Okay, the key thing is we're looking at 30 centimeters uh, cucumbers, 400 grams, achieved 10 days sooner than any of the other light sources, and there was a 68% increase in dry matter accumulation. Now part of what we did with this is we used an ETFE film that is a phase change film. It doesn't reduce the light, it transfers the green light to the red light. And we can simply turn that in the light pipe so that when we need to hit the fruiting period, we simply increase the red light. This way, unlike LEDs, we're able to do it when it's needed. Uh, with no disrespect to LEDs, by the way, they certainly have <coughs> Okay, 20,000 at life, our lifespan. It's not. Um, it's just the magnetron, a particular part of components, which luckily they had some guys, physicists from the CERN project, 
have a look at it, fix it, and now that's how we do it. Um, the bulb itself lasts forever. And end of life, which is one of the things that we look at with the Wii Directive, etc. nowadays, my understanding that LEDs are based on some very nasty chemicals. Um, sulfur plasma, you can smash it, throw it on the compost. Apart from the glass, of course. Okay, the last subject, how am I doing for time? Ten minutes. Ten minutes, my God. Okay, I'll get to slow down a bit now. Okay, those are the technological things, that's what this conference is about. I did want to raise biochar, and there's a unit downstairs. I've got ten minutes, so I'm going to take advantage of that. Okay. First explorer down the Amazon basin described a huge civilization, much bigger than the Aztecs, and much more integrated. He was called Oyeka, and uh, his work previously and afterwards was all, he was a professional explorer. The next people down, 38 years, described nothing, so he must have made it up. 1970s, a landscape archaeologist, that's someone who flies over areas and observes the ground conditions and finds where there's been an Iron Age fort uh, in a piece of ground that's been uh, ploughed 10,000 times. Started seeing dual carriageways running through the undergrowth uh, just outside of Mariners. Uh, he, went, he went out with his girlfriend, who was also an archaeology student, and they went to where the roads seceded, and all the locals knew all about them, and they found vast amounts of pottery, clearly signs of a very integrated society. But we know what happened to them as people. Um, 112 Spanish soldiers, despite having steel, did not defeat the Aztecs. Smallpox wiped them out, and they just skewered the last few. If you were to drop Ebolite on Somerset, 50% of the population would die. If you invited them all to Glastonbury Festival and dropped Ebolite on it, all of them would die. The more integrated a society, the more the ability to spread disease the more the ability that once you have reached a critical point, the system doesn't work anymore, it all falls apart. We know what happens to the people. The Amazon rainforest is the oldest rainforest on the planet, and we know that stone is in rare supply there, everything's built out of wood. If anyone's been in a rainforest, you can pretty much uh, figure out that um, the microbial activity, the macrobial activity, and the relative humidity in that canopy, everything decomposes unless it has that heat cool, heat cool process to keep the building uh, alive. But nobody could figure out what they ate. There isn't a civilization in the history of man that hasn't used agriculture. Agriculture is based on grasses. My example of this is normally have a cup of tea, water, tea bag, all that lovely ground staining. That's the nutrients coming out of the decomposition process. Lots of decomposition in the rainforest. You then pour five liters of water in the cup. There is nothing left. It is highly leached. Okay, so how do they survive? You can't be on fish alone. And it took about four years before the scientists, with respect to them, actually asked the locals, and then they started discovering there was all these pots of black soil. And when they looked at the black soil, it was packed full of charcoal. And then this started a whole discussion with the locals to find there were vast areas of this human-made soil. The blackness comes from the charcoal, which they've somehow figured to slash and char, not slash and burn. I worked with Professor Johan Learman 14 years ago now, who is uh, based at Cornell, uh, Ithaca, who is sort of the, the head of all biochar research, with 23 other researchers, <coughs> one person interested at any university that I went to. My second university was Reading, Saw Science Department, which is a fantastic place, but even there, when I took it to them, it's interesting, but that's about it. Three years crop trials at the University of Rio with the normal soil. The normal soil for Monsanto sponsored fertilizers matched the crop. The Terra Preta, which is actually the original name of this, is the soil, and the Terra Preta with fertilizers added to it. Three crops three years crop trial. The normal soil hardly goes to seed, mm -hmm. as expected. Monsanto sponsored fertilizers, it goes to seed, but it's not economically viable. The terra preta, mean figure, three years, three different crops, canola, um, wheat, and a local pulse crop, 880% increase in yield. The fertilizers knocked that down between 200 and 300%. We don't understand very much about soil microbiology. The professor lead at the School of Soil Science at the University of Reading, which has not been there, is a four-story building with soil written on it. It's got nothing to do with agriculture, nothing to do with horticulture. It's purely the study of this stuff we stand on, which contains 70% of all life by weight under the ground, not above it. We'll tell you, we've spent millions developing petrochemical fertilizers, matched the crop, we would spend about 50p understanding the soil we put in it. Whilst I was there, there were three PhDs just to figure out, on offer, how does an earthworm digest in its summer? We don't know. Okay. 
for whatever reason, all of a sudden, <coughs> and the only thing I can compare it to, if I have a few minutes, five minutes, okay. Uh, I was there when Nirvana first came out on John Peel, and uh, me and my guitarist had a great time running around telling everybody we discovered this amazing band, etc., etc., and walking around feeling very proud of ourselves. All of a sudden, everybody knows about it, and you feel kind of gutted because it was yours. Um, there was 23 researchers, we spoke to everybody, no one was interested. All of a sudden, it's the most important subject on the planet. James Lovelock came out two years ago after in 2000 to say that it doesn't matter, stop all the CO2 production today, we're still screwed. Came out two years ago saying this is the single solution to climate change, irrelevant for this improvement to soil. Now what's happened, and when I first raised it to Bill, so I asked, can we please put this on the Sahara Forest Project, his first response, if I may say, was to turn around and say, oh my God, I've seen these systems, they're full of bells and whistles, and oh, they're just a nightmare. One of the things you can do when you create biochar is to take a gas off it for biogas and store that and use it, and that's great, fantastic, and there's certainly a place for it. Lots of universities, University of uh, Edinburgh, who I spoke to twice, um, University of East Anglia, uh, have hit their patrons for very large sums of money to build all single dancing systems to use with municipal waste and create biogas stuff. Fantastic. But if we're going to follow what James Lovelock said, we have to be able to do this across the planet. So we have a very simple damn system. Yes, thank you. Uh, you may or may not be aware of something called a rocket stove. Um, first of all, before I launch into that, you know, creating charcoal is the first technology of modern man. That's why we have steel. Okay? We kind of know a lot about how to do it. So the bells and whistles are all great and certainly have their place, but <coughs> turning wood into charcoal isn't brain surgery. This is a retort. It takes the gases that come off and reburns those gases to the point there's nothing left. The rocket stove was uh, a very well engineered, a very simple system that is just incredible it's, uh, thermal efficiency, and the UN bought millions of them and dropped them all over Africa and South America, etc. at the time, reduce the amount of wood people were using. This is at the University of Sheffield under private contract, we hasten to add, so there's no IP conflict between us and the University of Nottingham, um, to uh, um, fluid dynamically model it to make it as efficient as possible. But my remit to our biochar guy is I want something you can drop out the back of a plane, turn it the right way up, and get on with Because we're going to be able to distribute this through Ecuador, through South America, through Africa in a form that you can just use and get on with it. So, that's the end of my presentation. Um, if you want to ask any questions, the experts in the room, and I'll go to the toilet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Very good question. When, when that light test was done, one of the key things that was done, the presumption in, in growing up until this point, is that around 440, 650 nanometers is the, the spectrum that you want. Okay? Everything else is kind of irrelevant because that's what's been tested the most. Okay? So the morphology of the plant and the responses to light is pretty much focused on those two things. So the tests that were done at Bargain were purposely done so that the amount of watts per square centimeter on the plant uh, and joules, moles per thing, which is not my area of expertise that needs to be. Um, was matched at those two frequencies. So what was being tested was the rest of the spectrum. And the feedback from Bargainen, the head of research for plant uh, physiology, was that this opens up the entire debate about how plants respond to life. So that's where we are um, with that. Uh, the ability to shift the light from the green spectrum to the red spectrum using the fil filters, uh, the films that we have, is amazing. I haven't overrun them. <laughs> I have two reputations as a half hours project. One is that I get the job done, and the other is that I talk a lot. I did add of sense to the end of that. That's done. <laughs> That's in debate still. So. Okay. <coughs> Any other questions?